Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to speak about the uh, solar energy generation problem and how it was more or less solved in the 1930s. But in spite of the subtitle, From Eddington to Peter, I want to start a little earlier. It will be appropriate to start in uh, the late Victorian era uh, with the theory of solar energy, which was the favored one of the period. Indeed, it was the only one which was seriously considered. So we had a very high status, the so-called gravitational contraction theory, also known as the uh, Helmholtz Thomson theory. <coughs> the name due, of course, to the great uh, Hermann von Helmholtz, who originally suggested this idea in uh, the 1850s, and then it was uh, mm. developed in great mathematical details by William Thomson, who, of course, is also known as, or at least was known since the 1890s at uh, Lord Kelvin. The uh, idea of this uh, theory of solar uh, energy generation is quite simple. It's based on a, an old result of the, po of the potential energy for a, uh, for a sphere, and if this sphere uh, decreases in size, in, in size uh, then the uh, change in potential energy will be transformed into kinetic energy uh, in the form of radiation energy. Uh, that theory, not least because of the enormous uh, status which both uh, Helmholtz and Tel uh, Kelvin had a, at the time, had a very high status. Um, but by the no 1890s, it was uh, increasingly recognized that it was in trouble not least with regard to the age of the sun. So this problem, the age of the sun, was um, very tightly connected with the uh, very much discussed age of the earth problem. And as you undoubtedly know, there was this uh, decade-long uh, discussion principally between geologists or, and natural historians on one side who wanted a very old earth and then uh, the physicist, or rather Kelvin, who wanted a much younger Earth. Uh, and the, the point is that uh, the most advanced uh, calculation which Thompson came up with uh, about 1900 resulted in uh, an age of the sun, and therefore also, also an age of the Earth of the order one or two, uh, 10 to 20 a billion nonsense million years which uh, was way too small to the geologist and indeed to later knowledge. Uh, nonetheless, uh, still at that time, the theory had a very high reputation. So we have in, in, uh, in a book of 1893, written by an astronomer who's probably not well known today, but who was very well known in his own time, Robert um, Stable Ball, an Irish astronomer who worked mostly in Dublin, but about 1890 was called to a position in astronomy and geometry in Cambridge. And in one of his popular books, he wrote many popular, he was a very accomplished uh, popular writer. He has this to say, he says about the contraction theory that there's no doubt that it gives a true explanation. So he has complete confidence in it. But now uh, read a... Uh, Another quotation from, uh, from Ball just 10 years later. That is in a letter to one of his friends, uh, John Jolie, another Irish a physicist and a geologist, also a very high standing at the time. And he says, have you seen radium? It certainly gets over the greatest of scientific difficulties, namely the question of sun heat. So something new has come up. And that is radium, or rather radioactivity, discovered in 1896. And by the early years of the 20th century, radioactivity become uh, a very hot and a very fashionable field of research, not least because people didn't know what radioactivity was. Uh, so there is a period, uh, an intermezzo, so to speak, of a, about 10 years when, uh, when it was widely believed that uh, the reason why the sun shines is that it's radioactive. Why not? There was radioactivity uh, all over 
And that, of course, is what Ball uh, refers to. So let's imagine that the sun is indeed retroactive. It cannot exist a radium. The half-life of radium is much too small. But perhaps it consists of uranium or some other uh, radioactive elements which produce daughter nuclei, nuclei and so on. Uh, so uh, very distinguished scientists such as uh, Rutherford himself, uh, one of the key players, of course, in, in radioactivity and the co-discoverer <laughs> of the radioactive decay law, took that uh, idea very seriously. Another one is um, George Darwin, the son of Charles Darwin, a very uh, prominent uh, geophysicist and astronomer, mathematician, who says that uh, in a somewhat convoluted uh, way of phrasing it, but deliberately, we have no right to assume that the sun is in incapable of liberating atomic energy and so on. I uh, notice that he's not saying we have right to assume that the sun is capable. He is changing his language because he wants to be very cautious. Also notice the term atomic energy. Uh, Darwin was not the first one to use it, but it is, it is a term which comes up uh, in the wake of radioactivity. And then we have in Germany uh, a later no Nobel laureate, Johannes Stock, uh, who, uh, who's saying pretty much the same about his uh, focusing on, on, on the uh, uh, formation of new uh, of, of the elements. Another of these uh, very old questions we had been uh, debated over time. And I want to, to point out that there are two questions in this whole um, issue. One is a solar energy question, and the other is the question of the formation of elements out of other elements. These two questions are different, but uh, historically, uh, they are very tightly connected. Uh, this uh, hypothesis, it shouldn't really be called a theory because it was never developed into a, a full uh, bona, bona fide theory, um, it was more a hypothesis or a um, speculation, and it slowly died out by the early 1910s. On the other hand, at least seen um, in a somewhat anachronistic light, we may say that these people thinking of the sun as a radioactive machine uh, had come to the truth in the sense that radioactive processes, of course, are nuclear processes. But at that time, the atomic nucleus wasn't uh, uh, recognized to exist. That only happened uh, in the late 1910s when the bohr rutherford uh, atomic model was generally accepted. And people knew that all the mass, or the most of the mass, and all the positive charge is located in the tiny nucleus. That was about all they knew about it. Um, but about that time, sh shortly after World War I, uh, we have the first ideas that perhaps the sun's energy uh, is liberated by uh, nuclear transformations, for instance, by uh, four protons, we will call them today. And indeed, and uh, the very term proton was coined by Rutherford in 1920. Uh, people usually didn't call it a proton. They used other terms such as the hydrogen ion or the positive electron. If you meet the term positive electron about 1920, and it, it's, it's quite abundantly in the literature, it means a, uh, what we call a proton. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Eddington had this idea that perhaps uh, four protons somehow unite into a helium atom or nucleus. Uh, and why did he have this idea? Well, because um, Francis Aston and other people, uh, but you know that Aston at that time had developed the first primitive version of the mass spectrometer, so he could me actually measure the uh, atomic weights of the various isotopes. And uh, uh, according to Aston's measurements, uh, a helium atom is lighter than four uh, hydrogen atoms, which means that th this mass difference by transformation, by means of Einstein's energy mass uh, equivalency, uh, should give rise to all this energy. And that is what uh, Eddington says in, in 1920. Uh, 
And he de uh, developed this idea uh, in, the, in the decade uh, most forcefully and most influentially in his masterpiece of the internal constitution of the stars. Perhaps I also should mention that when I am speaking about solar energy, and people at the time were speaking about solar energy, or for that matter, in a uh, matter of formation in the sun, they were really speaking about stellar energy and stellar nuclear synthesis. Uh, so the sun is just one special example of this more general theory. Anyway, we have in this uh, very innovative and re really revolutionary book, uh, Eddington's two hypotheses of how um, intra-atomic energy may account for the sun's energy. Uh, one of them is this idea, what we would call a fusion process, four protons unite somehow to uh, make a helium uh, nucleus. Uh, the other one which was uh, even older and much discussed, not only by Eddington, but also by his great contemporary James Jeans, uh, is an annihilation process. But a one strange one as, as seen from a modern perspective, because the proton is a baryon and the electron is a lepton, and barons and leptons cannot unite. They are forbidden according to conservation laws. But people happily, they don't knew these con conservation laws at that time. So this process where a proton and an electron unites into a gamma quantum made per perfect sense at the time. And he considered both processes. Uh, but at that time, one may say that it would have been nice if it had waited just one or two years we writing that book. 1926 is roughly the period in which quantum mechanics comes at the stage. And uh, it, it came a little too uh, uh, early for uh, Eddington to consider. So let me just point out, if you should, should know that quantum mechanics, which is after all the kind of theory which explains uh, the problem, originated in the late fall of uh, 1925, in, primarily in Göttingen, in Germany, by Heisenberg and his collaborators, Max Born and Pascal Jordan. Uh, about a year or half a year later, uh, Erwin Schrödinger in Austria, well, Switzerland actually, uh, formulated his uh, version of quantum mechanics known as wave mechanics, and very soon it was realized that these two different versions of quantum mechanics are mathematically equivalent. So by 1926, people began to speak about wave mechanics, uh, qu quantum mechanics. And that theory was enormously successful. It could explain a lot of things about the atomic electrons and, and other phenomena involving electrons and photons and so on. But people simply didn't know whether quantum mechanics was applicable to the tiny atomic nucleus, which was really an terra incognita. So 1928, in this respect, uh, is a very uh, important year, because that was a year in which physicists uh, at least understood a bit of the atomic nucleus by means of quantum mechanics. This discovery was made, as discoveries very often are, in independently by two researchers with no connection. Uh, the best known is um, uh, Ga uh, George Gamow, uh, the Russian physicist. He was Russian at the time, but he worked in, uh, in Germany, in Göttingen. Uh, and the other uh, was in the US, uh, Gurley and Condon. They made pretty much the same theory, but uh, slightly later than Gamow. So he's best known under Gamow's name. Uh, here we have Gamow, who was a very important uh, actor in this, this whole uh, development. And uh, anyone who has ever looked in an introductory textbook in quantum mechanics uh, there are always this classical case of the tunnel effect, uh, where a charged particle uh, escapes the uh, potential barrier, apparently violating the energy conservation law, but in accordance with quantum mechanics. And there's a certain probability that this can happen, and this probability can be calculated by means of quantum mechanics, and this is what 
uh, gamma did in this uh, very important paper. So quantum theory, this atom kernels. That was in the summer of 1928. But very quickly, of course, people realized, and Gamma himself realized, that we, in, instead of explaining how the charged particles from the atomic nucleus escapes from the nucleus, then we can, this, all these equations are reversible. So we can just as well use the theory to uh, calculate the probability that an incoming charged particles enter the atomic nucleus and then uh, changes this uh, nucleus. And that, of course, is the very essence of uh, the fusion process, which was first considered uh, very shortly after, in 1929, in another paper. It's sort of interesting to point out that both this paper, written by a German and a Briton, uh, Haudelman was a young German, uh, theorist and uh, Robert Atkinson was a Brit working in Germany. Both of the papers, and Gamow, as I told you, was Russian, uh, but both of these papers were written in German and published in German papers. So this is still a time where German physics is very powerful. Indeed, Germany was the most powerful nation in physics <coughs> at the time. Four years before Hitler, right? Uh, so, so uh, what they also notice the title, so Frag der Aufwachmöglichkeit der Elemente in Sternen. It doesn't, it, it, it's not a paper about uh, energy production in the sun. It's a paper about how the elements are built up uh, in the stars and uh, in the sun. But uh, the other question is there as well, of course. It should also be noticed that at that time, everyone believed, everyone, that the atomic nucleus consists of electrons and protons. All matter consisted of two elementary particles, which were the only one knows, the proton and the electron. The neutron is still in the future. And nonetheless, in spite of this totally wrong model of the atomic nucleus, people could uh, apply quantum mechanics with some success to it. So this is the beginning, about only the beginning. As far as the sun and the stars is, co is concerned, it, th this is interesting only if we know what the stars actually consist of, the chemical constitution of the stars. And that question was turned what's called uh, up way down or something. Yeah. Uh, in the 1920s as well. Uh, because uh, still in the mid-1920s, the general belief among astronomers was that the stars consist roughly of the same elements in, in the same ratios as the elements on the Earth. With the elements in the middle of the periodic system, like iron and these kind of metals, as the most abundant elements in the, st in the sun, which is totally wrong, of course. Uh, that it was wrong and that hydrogen probably is the most abundant element was first suggested by Cecilia Payne in a PhD thesis from that time. Uh, her message was not well received, but within a couple of years, uh, this become, be, be, became the, the accepted wisdom. Uh, worked out by a number of important astronomers and astrophysicists, apart from Payne herself, uh, Henry Russell in the US, um, Albrecht Unsel in Germany, William McRae in Ireland or England, Eddington, and the Banks from, going from Denmark. And a few years later, by the late uh, 1930s, it was more or less known that this is true not only for the uh, solar atmosphere, but also for the interior of the sun. So we have, by that time, uh, pretty good um, theoretically based uh, knowledge about the, uh, the constitution of the sun, namely that uh, about 65% hydrogen is a little too low, helium about 30%. It, so the sun is basically consisting of, of, of uh, hydrogen and, and, uh, and, uh, <coughs> uh, and helium, which agreed with uh, other knowledge at the time uh, within the so-called branch of science known as cosmochemistry by analyzing meteors and uh, stellar spectra and a lot of other evidence the Norwegian uh, 
geochemist uh, Victor Goldschmidt made this uh, table of the uh, universal uh, distribution of the elements. I mean, how many, how, mon how many percent of this particular element is in the universe in, in, in average? A hydrogen completely dominating, of course, and helium. So that was known in the late 1930s. And uh, the first one who to, to try to solve the question uh, was that took part in Germany as well. Uh, the, the two most important figures clearly are Weizsäcker and Beta. Uh, Beta was the most important. But uh, Weizsäcker should be uh, mentioned as well. Um, in 1937 and 1938, uh, Weizsäcker wrote two important papers. But again, these dealt not primarily with solar energy, but more with uh, the formation of chemical elements in the stars. They are terribly interesting, not least because uh, Weizsäcker adopts a cosmological perspective. He's speculating that uh, billions of years ago, perhaps all matter in the universe was united in an intensely hot and intensely dense unit. I mean, this is the Big Bang picture we have here. Uh, and he's, he's also su suggesting a, um, a particular uh, nuclear reaction cycle known as a CNO cycle, but he doesn't um, develop, a, develop this idea in any great um, details. And anyway, within Weizsäcker lost interest in the, in, in the matter. And when the Second World War came, he had other things to do. He was one of the, he worked in the so-called Uranverein, the German uranium project. Uh, so the real beginning may well be said to be a um, very important meeting uh, held in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1938. Um, it was organized by George Gamow, who in the meantime had escaped Soviet Russia and uh, gone to the U.S. And we have uh, the big man here is uh, Gamow and his, uh, his uh, collaborator, Edward Tiller, who we have here, nuclear physicist, Hungarian, also uh, an immigrant, and uh, uh, various other important people. Here we have a very young uh, Chandra Seeker, uh, and we have Swanplane, also very young, up here, and we have not least, we have Beta here. Uh, at that time, Beta knew n nothing about astronomy, and he, he wasn't really interested. He was a nuclear physicist, a quantum physicist. But he had this amazing ability to, to um, absorb knowledge in a, in a new field very quickly. And so it was a direct outcome of, of this uh, uh, conference, the so-called PP cycle, which was not really Beta's idea, but was the idea of um, uh, uh, Charles Critchfield, a young American student of Teller's, but uh, when he met Beta, they collaborated, and within a very short time, they come up with a full-blown quantum mechanical nuclear theory of how, uh, of what happened uh, in the sun, the so-called PP cycle, starting with two protons uh, forming deuteron and then helium isotopes, but the net result is the very same which uh, Eddington speculated about in 1920, four protons transforming into a, uh, into a, uh, a helium nucleus. Uh, the, the other process, which I will consider in a minute, is a so-called CNO, CNO process, uh, which is a bit more complicated, and that uh, process was uh, published by, and that was Beta's work alone. Uh, this is really his masterpiece, uh, a, a fantastic paper, very much Beta. Um, published in Physical Review, Energy Production in Sun, Beta didn't care about how the heavier elements were formed. He focused on the energy production problem. And, uh, and here we have uh, that is from the abstract here, we have these ideas I'll mention in a minute. Uh, he also 
the, the point is that this theory was very detailed. It was based on quantum mechanics, and it was based on laboratory physics in the sense that Beta uh, made use of the uh, reaction probabilities, what physicists call the cross-sections of various nuclear processes. So he knew this data, uh, which uh, Weizsäcker didn't, and he would incorporate it in his theory. And he came up with a theory which was uh, very impressive um, in the sense that it uh, could reproduce uh, the relevant data. Um, let me just show a more easily uh, easy picture of, of this process. Sometimes it's called the beta Weizsäcker or the Weizsäcker beta cycle for historical reasons. Uh, CNO uh, are the elements uh, which enter this process, but they have a sort of catalytic function. Um, this uh, very nice uh, picture, by the way, is from a popular book or semi-popular book written by George Gamow in 1940, The Birth and Death of the Sun. Highly recommendable. Uh, and, but the point is that in these uh, uh, elaborate processes, if you add and subtract and I don't know what, you end up with the very same uh, net process. This, the Greek new we have here, signifies a neutrino. Weizsäcker didn't consider the neutrinos at all. Uh, Beta did. And Beta realized somehow that the neutrinos were important. Uh, it should be pointed out that the neutrinos, nobody really knew whether neutrinos existed or not. They were purely hypothetical. You know that the neutrinos was originally suggested by Wolfgang Pauli, 1930. Then it was incorporated in, in uh, Fermi's theory of weak interactions. But they remained hypothetical particles until the late uh, 1950s when they were eventually detected. And then they gave rise to the famous solar energy or solar neutrino problem. But that's a later story. Um, so to end, more or less, uh, there's no doubt, I mean, Beta's paper was recognized from the very start to be a breakthrough paper. It, it, it was published at, unfortunately, 1939, uh, not a good year to publish important papers in. Um, but Beta continued working on it uh, after his uh, long time association with the Los Al Alamos project and so on. Indeed, he worked on it until his, his death not very many years ago. Um, and um, and um, uh, it's also, uh, I would like to end with considering this problem, uh, solar energy and uh, nuclear astrophysics within a Nobel context, because uh, Beta did receive the Nobel Prize for his work, as he should, but very belatedly, which is not unusual within the Nobel system at all. Um, but still, he was the first physicist who, was, uh, who received a prize for what astronomers believed was astronomy, so to speak. As you know, there is no uh, Nobel Prize in astronomy. Uh, there could have been, but... Uh, for various reasons, uh, astrophysics was also considered not to belong to the Nobel system. But at that time, uh, people in Stockholm apparently changed their mind. Uh, uh, and and uh, my very um, last remarks is that even in the late 1930s, we have in the United States in particular, and in California even more particular, Nuclear physics, experimental nuclear physics, uh, on a very advanced scale. And uh, some of these people, uh, especially uh, William, uh, William Fowler at the Kellogg uh, Laboratory, uh, made experiments in the laboratory more or less simulating what they believed uh, happened in the sun. Um, and. Fowler to receive the, the Nobel Prize. That's a, that's a somewhat different story, but I will not, not 
like to mention it anyway because it was a bit controversial. Um, not that Fowler received the prize, he certainly deserved it, everyone agreed, but uh, a main reason why he received this prize was a fundamental uh, theory he did collaboratively with uh, George and Margaret Burbage and not least Fred Hoyle, the B2HF <coughs> theory. And uh, as you well know, Hoyle, Sir Hoyle, Sir Fred, never received the prize. And many people believe and still believe that this was most unfair. Thank you. laboratory science there, teaching them about something that we consider to be astronomy much of the time. Um, questions? Uh, okay, I will, uh, I didn't ask, hasn't asked a question yet, first of all, <laughs> okay, uh, but not, you get to ask some questions. Uh, yes. Did that come into these equations in any way that you calculations? Yeah. Uh, when, when, when Pauli first suggested the neutrino without publishing his idea in 1930, he thought it had mass. Mm -hmm. And he says in his letter yeah. uh, to the radioactive ladies and gentlemen uh, that, that he imagined the neutrino to be maybe have 10% of the electron's mass. So he considered it to be a massive particle. Uh, but when, it, when he entered Fermi theory, uh, Fermi didn't have any use of mass, so to speak. Uh, and then it, became, it came, be, became common to conceive it as a, um, a zero mass uh, particle. Um, the only way it entered these relations in, is in the form of energy. The mass doesn't uh, mean anything. And that, well, that's a long story, of course. And, uh, just fairly recently, we have a new picture of the neutrino. In the 1930s and late 1920s, uh, the large majority of astronomers uh, certainly were uninterested in quantum physics. They didn't understand it, and they didn't see any reason why they should try to understand it. Um, so uh, it was a small minority of uh, astrophysicists. Astrophysics, of course, by that time was well established. Uh, but astrophysics was basically uh, spectroscopic, astrospectroscopy, and, uh, and theory didn't enter significantly. So there, there were, uh, at the time, uh, some internal discussion in the astronomical community, uh, n n not only, well, with regard to these uh, very mathematical things which the physicists came up with, and said to the astronomers, you have to take them seriously. Not only quantum mechanics, but also general relativity, for instance. Um, but it was a very small part of the uh, astronomer, uh, astronomical community who took an interest in it. Yes, uh, uh, these models, I mean, uh, models of the constitution of stars uh, does not crucially rely on quantum mechanics. And they go farther back in time uh, to Eddington and even before him to Emden's uh, gas kugel. Uh, so, so, and, and, and they were uh, well-known um, 
um, and, and, and people on the basis of these models, uh, they had estimated the internal temperature. And uh, Eddington had figured for the sun, uh, it would be close to 20 billion million, million degrees. And um, that was important in this respect because as you can see from here, the cross section, the, uh, especially for the CNO title, is extremely dependent on the temperature, 10 to the power of 17. So just a slight uh, change in the temperature will mean that this process um, changes re relative to the other one in significance. And Beta actually, in, in his work just before the war, uh, he argued that the CNO cycle was the one which dominated energy production in the sun. And he was wrong. Uh, after World War II, it became known that the PP cycle is the dominant one. Both cycles take place, and that's because uh, there has been a slight uh, uh, re-evaluation of the sun's temperature. If I can just ask one, um, you mentioned um, Feinsecker articulates something that looks very like Big Bang theory to us. Yes, now. yes. Does that get picked up by people later, or is it independent of? Uh, not uh, really. I mean, uh, uh, these kind of speculations were not original to Weizsäcker. Uh, in this paper, Weizsäcker does not refer to, but it is almost certain that he was well aware <coughs> of the Charles Lemaitre's. Uh, work from the early 1930s. Uh, Lemaitre compared the, he, he was the father of the Big Bang uh, idea, and he, he saw that the original universe uh, had the same density as the atomic nucleus. It was highly radioactive, then it exploded um, spontaneously. God didn't have to tell it, just followed the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, so uh, that's basically the, the same idea which might say could come up with uh, in this uh, re 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 respect. But, but uh, um, I thought also said many of these ideas in the 1930s, especially the late 1930s, some of them were very brilliant and stimulating, but because of the war, uh, they, they, they had very little impact. Okay, thank you. Um, Right, if I could thank Professor Clark and all